subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Good evening, everyone in India. Good morning, in my case, here in the United States. Ajit, it's a privilege to do this with you. Obviously, Facebook is a company that's being touched every day by issues and debates at the global level, the national level, the local level. So I thought uh, for purposes of this discussion, um, we might start at the global level, then work our way to India, and then uh, go from regulatory trends there down to local trends and developments that are meaningful for a company. We have 30 minutes or so uh, with a little bit of flex. So I thought we might chat for about 20 minutes and then we'll pull in the audience if that makes sense to you. Sounds good, Evan. Great. Well, you know, at the global level, there's a debate uh, about whether we'll continue to see integration or its obverse, which is fragmentation, both of markets and of standards. And the latter, it seems to me, can come either from competing or irreconcilable regulatory regimes that create harmonization and alignment problems for companies or else at a strategic level from techno-nationalism, which is to say that governments around the world are erecting barriers to the flows of capital, technology, data, and frankly, in some cases, people uh, that originate in certain other countries. So you're sitting in India. We've had the phenomenon of the app ban on, I think it's over 200 Chinese apps now. In my own country, we've seen this rear its head. President Trump issued an executive order on WeChat, an executive order on TikTok. So first, I'm wondering if you can give us your sense of the trajectory there. Are strategic rivalries between governments essentially fragmenting the marketplace in ways that are uncomfortable for companies like Facebook, but also that leave consumers with less choice? And how do we navigate that more fragmented landscape? Um, great question, uh, Evan, and, and thank you for uh, for this conversation. Um, when I step back and look at uh, uh, that framing that you had, Evan, a um, couple of things. Um, one, if you look at the last 25 years of the internet, um, it's fairly indisputable that countries across the world, uh, and of course companies as well of all sizes, have benefited from the idea of a single interconnected world, right? The internet, um, that 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 kind of permissiveness of connecting people around the world, uh, I do believe that has yielded extraordinary benefit for uh, all kinds of uh, countries of different sizes. Uh, we have seen extraordinary innovation uh, come out of the 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 nature. Of, of the global internet. Um, so uh, no surprise that uh, I do believe there is extraordinary value uh, in the idea uh, of a world that is connected. Um, having said that, I, I would call out a couple of things. One, we already have some element of fragmentation in the internet. I, I think uh, in some ways, China stands separate from most of the rest of the world. Um, and, and, and I would argue that um, in, in many ways, I think India has stood out for its openness. Uh, uh, and, and we'll talk about what's happened in India in the last five years in particular, uh, and, and what it really means for the country and the opportunity uh, for India to transform itself in a very positive uh, direction. Uh, but India has chosen to, uh, to be open to be connected to the global internet. Um, and, and, and the other thing when you look at this is, it does make sense for countries to look at new rules to govern the internet. Uh, I, I think we as a company have been vocal that we welcome regulation, that uh, all of the explosive innovation that happened in the first five, 10, 15, 20 years of the internet, um, uh, did happen without a lot of governing rules. And, and that always happens, Evan. I, th I think you have studied this quite a bit, that whenever new technologies have emerged, the early years have usually been characterized by um, just you know uh, unconstrained innovation, experimentation, and testing out of, of models. But, but like 
all very high speed highways, uh, it does make sense to have some traffic lights. It does make sense to have some uh, rules. Um, and I think we are at the stage globally in India and around the world where uh, stakeholders across the board, including governments that write uh, 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 the governing laws as well as the regulations, are, are starting to think, you know, okay, we have seen explosive innovation. We recognize the benefit, but if you look at the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, can we have a framework that governs the new rules of the internet? And I think that is right. I, I, I do think it makes sense to, uh, to, to think about what those new rules should be. Um, so in that context, I would argue that it does make sense for countries that are like-minded, countries that believe in uh, democratic values, that believe in strong institutions, that believe in open societies, uh, and, and I would argue that India uh, has had a long history uh, of transparency, strong institutions, uh, and a democratic setup, um, should think about uh, creating uh, almost an alliance of democracies. And, and, and for me, US, Europe, and, and India uh, probably represent the three big poles of the internet. And uh, while recognizing that there is a need for new rules of the internet, I would argue that these three poles, to the extent to which uh, we can think about a democratic alliance that thinks about what the global framework should be about these new rules, uh, we probably uh, can conceive of an internet which still remains open and connected and can yield all the benefits of innovation that we have seen in the last 25 years, and yet has a unified global fr framework uh, that, that gives us a new set of rules for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, Evan. Yeah, you know, I'm struck by that framing because obviously, as you said, China stands apart in a lot of ways, both its approach to the internet, its approach to regulation, the heavy hand of the security state, of the state itself, and so on. And so there's been a lot of ideas kicking around for kind of a, I guess I'd call it a posse of the like-minded, as you said. But even on some of the cross-border data access and transfer initiatives where there are obvious like-minded, say Japan and India, for instance. There's been an inability to reach agreement. I think about, for instance, Prime Minister Abe's data initiative, the so-called Osaka Initiative, which India, for example, did not did not sign up to. So that begins to get us into national dynamics a little bit, because if, as you said, you want to get agreement around global rules and standards, you need to start by anchoring that in national level regulatory regimes and standards. So. Um, I want to push you a little bit on this idea of fragmentation of regulatory regimes, and particularly on India. But I, I'm wondering if it's getting harder for a company like Facebook to work across national borders as different regulatory structures and regimes emerge, right? Obviously, in Europe, you have GDPR. Uh, the United States, you've got CPRA in California, which is moving a little bit closer to GDPR standards. But we're in the midst of this highly dynamic rethink uh, around data governance and regulation. So how do you how do you see that playing out in different regional contexts and how do we get to the kind of concert that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one, uh, Evan, I would argue that, um, you know, creating a global framework, uh, as you can imagine, uh, won't be uh, that easy. Um, and yet, I think if you look at the uh, the history of the world, um, in many ways, we have we have been able to create global frameworks for big things, uh, whether it goes back to some of the trade frameworks that uh, we have created in the past. Uh, and, and my argument would be that the benefit of retaining the elements of an interconnected world, especially uh, in terms of the connection between democratic societies that share values, I think there is commonality if you look at if you look at what india cares about and many other ca countries care about i do think there are there are there's a commonality of what countries are maximizing for uh, in many ways there's the shared values um, and therefore um, i will argue that we are at the early stages of uh, trying to discover what that common framework would look like but there are enough examples in the past that that 
countries have been able to come together and create those frameworks that have created extraordinary value for uh, countries around the world. And, and I would argue that in the case of the internet, um, the, the very nature of the internet, uh, the very nature that we benefit when people and institutions and businesses are connected across the world, uh, and, and, and I think India has benefited from that, uh, means that we have to try even harder to seek that common ground, create that common uh, framework, especially among societies that are democratic. Do you, do you sense that governments understand that? I think so. Uh, I think so, Evan. Um, and, and again, I, I think you have to step back and, and, and think about it, not just from the framework of Facebook as a company. And, and uh, no surprise, I think I, I would argue that we have benefited from a global internet, but I do believe we have contributed to a global internet as well. Um, uh, I, I think uh, with, with the very nature of the company, which is to connect communities around the world, um, uh, you know, this agenda is important to us and, and we have an extraordinary belief in it. Um, and, 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 and at the same time, I think we've also called out that we do realize that there are some extraordinarily important issues around uh, privacy and, and around uh, data and around uh, just looking at what should these new navigation rules uh, should be. Um, I, I think it makes sense to invest that time to understand the, uh, the unique concerns of different countries and yet look for that common ground that maximizes the opportunity uh, for countries and societies. And, and I do again believe that um, there is there is such extraordinary potential in the value of innovation, and and as a country, India too will benefit from it. Um, and and it doesn't require a company like Facebook to tell India what to do, right? I don't think that's what we are doing. Um, uh, I, I but but I, I I do believe that uh, when I look at the potential of digital to transform India, and we have seen a lot of that even in the last five years. Um, and, and, and you know, it, it's an important one to call out here, Evan, that when I look at India, and, and I think India does stand out that uh, more than 500 million people have come online uh, in the last less than five years. And I, I'm not sure, even in China, you have seen that kind of a shift in access to affordable broadband in this short a period of time. And, and therefore, I would argue, Evan, that as much as we have seen explosive innovation in India in the last five years, we have barely scratched the surface of what is possible. In many ways, you know, um, uh, if, if there are 600, 700 million people online today, the, 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 the access side of it, the needle has been really moved. But we are only starting to now look at what does that mean in sectors that can have a dramatic impact on prosperity in India? What does it mean if you can leverage the scale of this access to the internet to light up education for all the 700 million? What if we can provide access to uh, health using technology for all of that 700 million and then the 1.3 billion? Um, and, and therefore, you know, to the extent that uh, this is the opportunity for India to really exploit that access, to now look at how do we now build those foundational layers of uh, access to services um, on the back of so many people being online. I think we're just, we, we are at the very early stages of that innovation. And a lot of that, a lot of those business models, a lot of those investments um, will be focused on India, will come out of India. But the scale of India also means that a lot of those innovations will actually be defining for the world. And, and a great example is, is UPI. Um, I don't think there's been an equivalent anywhere in the world where uh, an initiative from the government has created a private-public partnership that is essentially creating an entirely foundational layer for financial inclusion uh, uh, in, in the country. So I, I, I genuinely think we have just scratched the surface of um, yielding the benefit of all the access that's happened. Um, and in that context, I think, um, I, I do think remaining connected, 
uh, while still uh, solving for the interests of India is the is the right uh, way forward. You know, I want to ask you a little bit about the regulatory framework, but given what you just said, I wonder if you could put Facebook a little more into the picture on digital adoption a little bit and, and talk a little bit about how specifically the company is trying to help unlock the digital ecosystem in India. As you said, there's this extraordinary opportunity, right? You've got 600 million plus internet users. You've got 700 million plus smartphone users. You've got something like, what, 30% growth in e-commerce in India now. So how can technology companies, Facebook, but not just Facebook, help yeah, yeah. with the process of digital adoption in India yeah. or elsewhere? Yeah. And, and I'll start with Facebook in India, but I, I think exactly as you framed it, Evan, it applies for tech companies more broadly and, and frankly, anywhere in the world. But uh, I would break it into four or five uh, different areas, Evan. One, of course, is I think it's the uh, it's the fundamental uh, belief in inclusion and affordability. I, I think the fact that Facebook as a company has chosen to remain free and, and therefore build revenue models on the back of you know, a model like advertising, but it comes from the deep belief that keeping the services free, even though there's a lot of investments in product and infrastructure that goes into keeping those services free, means that these services are going to be used by a very large number of people. And, and I do believe that uh, that model fundamentally adds value to societies, right? Compared to, say, if we were to focus only on a subscription-only model. So the, the focus on affordability and inclusion and, and building revenue models that allow us to keep our services free is a big part of it. I do think the second part uh, is, Evan, what I mentioned uh, earlier in terms of um, can a company like us or other companies, uh, whether it's companies that we partner with like Geo or other companies, um, can we fundamentally contribute to building foundational layers that are built on that extraordinary success that we as a country have had in expanding access to the internet? UPI is an example of it when it comes to payments. But frankly, I think a lot of the work, for example, that we are doing today between WhatsApp and Geo, that's focused on digitizing small businesses. The focus on how do we really make sure that the 60 million odd small businesses in India can come online, they have access to digital tools, and that digitization, essentially, I would almost look at it as a two-sided equation, Evan, right? We have those 700 people who have come online, but if, if you look at the world of uh, 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 business, the, the power is if you can bring the 60 million businesses online as well in a way that allows the two sides to connect, those 60 million businesses to connect with these 700 million consumers and 1.3 billion in the future, um, that's, 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 that's a foundational work. So any work we do in terms of digitization there and different companies in my mind are contributing to different parts of it. And, and the more we think about it as obviously it has to be commercially viable, it has to be win-win, but it is looking at the canvas of building foundational layers. That's the second area. I think the third one is gender, uh, Evan. Uh, even with all the extraordinary success that India has had in expanding access to the internet, um, there's a there's an enormous gender imbalance. It's 65, 35, I think, you know, 65% men, 35% women. Um, I do believe all companies, including companies like ours, which has services that are quite, you know, it's used every day. People engage with it through the day. I think we have a role to play. I think we have a responsibility and an obligation. Um, and some of the work that we do, for example, is how do we make sure that we build products that women feel safe using. So a lot of the concerns that we hear when we talk to uh, women around the country is even on just the idea of coming onto Facebook and connecting with uh, friends and family and groups that they care about, one of the things that they worry about is, you know, what happens to the photo I put up uh, uh, online? So a lot of our effort has been just to solve for how do you create easy tools to give uh, people the comfort that 
their photo, photo can't be downloaded easily, right? You can lock it. You can lock your profile. You can control who gets access to it. But that's that, that's just an example. I think there's a lot of other companies who are doing a lot of work to make sure that uh, women feel safe coming onto the internet, which begins, which becomes the starting point for exploiting the internet, right? That's where you move the needle. Um, and 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 the the fourth area I would call out is education and health. I think anything that any company can do, uh, which fundamentally expands affordable access to universal education and universal uh, health, and and then start to look at high quality access and technology changes the game, right? Uh, some of the constraints of scale, you know, uh, how many physical classrooms how many teachers, uh, access to curriculum, all of that can be simplified when you fundamentally think about it as online and, and, and using a combination of uh, uh, teachers as well as uh, tools uh, and algorithms. Uh, and I think we have barely scratched the surface of that. So um, I, I, I do think, Evan, and, and then of course, I think if you look at the agenda of businesses, the reality is the minute you are connected to the internet and you are starting to build these tools, you now can think of start, you know, the, the it used to be that there was a certain kind of a, 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 a staged approach. Someone would have an idea, you would start that business, it would invariably be physical, you would move online, you would scale it in India, a couple, few years in, you, you think of going global. I think all of those timelines are getting compressed your opportunity to move from having an idea to building a global business can be weeks. And frankly, Evan, we have seen in the last 18 months, companies that have gone from, they didn't exist to they're now worth 300 million in a period of 12 months on the back of building global businesses. So I, I think the canvas is fairly big. Can you talk? Can I? Can you talk a little bit about that Indian model and whether it can be exported and scaled, and where you see the most promise? What are the What are the things? What are your kind of top two or three things that you see happening in this space in India that are essentially global models? Yeah, uh, happy to, Evan. Uh, uh, look, there are there are in in a classic sort of way you can think of it as just using the internet to find uh, markets around the world, right? So you have you have something to sell. Uh, apparel, coffee, uh, and, and and what what a company like ours, or frankly other companies as well, what they allow you to do is to discover who has affinity for what you're selling pretty quickly, right? Uh, and and that's the whole model of building communities of interest. So it's not just that you have to establish physical presence in multiple countries around the world. Uh, you may not need to have uh, physical stores around the world. You could just think of it as you have a product and, and a lot of times the challenge is not physically moving the product from India to the world. The challenge is how do you discover communities of interest? And that's what the internet allows you. That, that it, it's, you know, if you're selling uh, coffee or apparel, you may have people who are interested in it as much in Chicago, Evan, where you are, as in Bangalore or Singapore or Dublin, right? That's that's one model. It, it, in some ways, it's a classic export model. I think there is a, a second model, uh, and we saw uh, some of it, which have kind of exploded in the last couple of years, where you're fundamentally uh, seeing the emergence of companies which are relying, they're tapping into human capital in India, using tools, and then finding uh, traction uh, of consumers around the world, uh, example being ed tech, education, right? Uh, you're tapping into, let's say, even in, in a category like coding. There's a, there's a vast amount of talent you can tap into in India of coders. Uh, you have kids around the world where the parents are very keen for them to learn coding. Now, in an earlier world, you know the constraints would have been cost, as well as you know when do you when do you make sure that the kids have access to those uh, classes outside of their normal school. All of that can be completely disrupted when you think of it as there are teachers in India uh, who can be available 24/7 to kids around the world. Um, 
uh, and and then you add a layer of you know uh, any kind of tools and algorithms that can supplement and augment that learning that's a model where i i, I believe uh, it, it can be unique uh, unique for india and then you know the third of course is yeah, if you look at models like entertainment and gaming right fundamentally that uh, you don't have to have constraints around language uh, you know if you look at gaming in particular uh, but even content i mean i think indian content could travel around the world where fundamentally the internet allows you to make your proposition uh, valid for the entire world not just india in a way that wouldn't have been possible in a world without the internet that's great. That's fascinating. So we're starting to get some questions pop up from the audience. And the first couple that I'm seeing are around regulation, but kind of micro elements of regulation. So before I go to that, I, I want you to just focus on the macro picture. Obviously, the regulatory landscape uh, around data, around privacy, it's evolving very rapidly in India. And I'm wondering if you could talk first just at the level of principle. What are the principles that you think, from the corporate standpoint, ought to govern the evolution of the regulatory regime in India. How do you how do you see it evolving? I think two three things, and 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 I think uh, Evan, we kind of uh, spoke about it uh, a bit earlier. One of course is you know just respecting the idea that there should be new rules for the internet, right? Uh, I, I I think uh, and and probably more so than many other companies. I think we have kind of articulated that we do believe. Uh, regulation is needed. I think I think it starts from that conversation, just respecting the idea of regulation, respecting the idea that countries like India will have uh, particular concerns, uh, particular things to solve for. That's one, I think. I think the second one is the idea of even uh, as, as countries look at creating particular frameworks around privacy and data, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the hope for a global framework. The hope that at least uh, democratic uh, societies, uh, countries that believe in uh, open societies, strong institutions, uh, playing by you know fair principles, would find a way uh, to connect with each other and create a global framework that still retains the power and potential of a global internet. Um, and 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 then the third one is you know the balance between. Uh, how do you kind of focus on making sure that there is enough transparency about, say, how data is used? Um, and, and, and hopefully a lot of it is relying on giving that power to users to decide how they want to engage with companies. Uh, and then still making sure that there is enough space for innovation to be unleashed. And, 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 and I would argue that that is the framework that will allow for competition, uh, both you know, between Indian companies and global companies, as well as small companies and large companies. One of the things, if you look at India in the last five and 10 years, is that even in the context of the current rules, right, and still recognizing that uh, there's value for new rules on multiple things, even on the back of uh, the current rules, there's been an extraordinary number of startups in India that have had tremendous success in scaling up in India and increasingly globally. So companies have, have competed with each other, small companies have competed with large companies and done extraordinarily well, managed to win across multiple categories. So, uh, you know, it'll be great to retain elements of innovation, even as you build clarity on the framework around privacy and data uh, would be the other principle I would call out, Evan. So I'm glad you mentioned startups and especially these very ambitious startups that are able to build globally, because it actually gets to one of the questions that's come in. We we have a question from Avinash, who he's worried about essentially regulation leading to higher compliance costs for for startups, and he asks, how do you how does India make sure that the increase in regulation doesn't essentially hurt the startup ecosystem by by raising a whole variety of compliance costs that they that they would struggle to meet. Yeah, and, and again, I think I think uh, it, it goes to the it, it goes to the point about you know we need new rules. Um, we need to make sure that uh, there is a common framework uh, on privacy and data, hopefully in a way that is globally aligned. And I think it, it, to Avinash's point, uh, for a startup, it also helps if what they're building for 
in India can work in Europe and 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 in the U.S. Uh, and in Latin America and in Africa. Um, so uh, I, I do think uh, to to the point uh, that you raised, Evan, earlier about this complex negotiation that is happening at multiple levels at the country level, thinking about how do you optimize for outcomes for the country at one level, thinking about how do you make sure that uh, new companies emerging from India can thrive? And then how do you still make sure that there is some element of alignment and commonality across multiple frameworks, especially for those who believe in democracy? I do think this is one of the things to, to solve for, to make sure that uh, hopefully there is transparency and clarity that allows both big companies and large companies to, to comply and compete and build businesses that are innovative and, and uh, allow us to really, uh, frankly, allow us to um, really um, uh, unleash the potential of, you know, what is still an early stage of uh, the transformation in India and around the world. You know, we have only had 600, 700 million people come online in the last five years. Uh, there's still a lot of explosive value uh, to be created for everyone, but particularly uh, all the people in India. Yeah. So, um, Ajit, I have a very direct Facebook question for you. <laughs> this comes from Rahul, who is asking about Facebook's partnership with Geo and basically says, how will that empower small and medium enterprises in India? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Rahul. Um, um, and, and two, three things. One, uh, even when we announced the investment in Geo uh, in April, uh, and then the partnership, uh, where we said we will work first between WhatsApp and Geo Martin and other areas, we did call out Rahul that we we both the companies will continue to work with other companies, um, and and we framed it very overtly as this is not a exclusive relationship, right? And and I think that's the spirit in which we are approaching it. One, that while, while there's a lot of opportunities for the two companies to work together and help build some of these foundational layers, we also recognize that what we build together will benefit other companies. It will definitely benefit consumers. Uh, we are very excited, for example, in the first partnership that we announced where the whole process of digitizing 60 million small businesses that Geo is leading and making it easy for those businesses to connect with consumers by making it easy uh, uh, from within WhatsApp to order from those businesses. can have, It adds a lot of value to consumers because you're reducing friction, you're making it easy a behavior that we already see, but with a lot of friction. And fundamentally, you're you're dramatically increasing the economic pie for those 60 million businesses and therefore for the country at large. But even that, that work that we are doing will have multiplier impact that will be beneficial for other companies. There will be many other companies which will figure out as this process happens, hey, there is an idea that we have. There's an idea for digitizing a business that we have, which someone will go and build and will create value. And, 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 and that's how it's going to be. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think if you look at the principle of the partnership, it's non-exclusive. If you look at the idea of digitizing the businesses, it expands the economic pie. And then if you look at what is likely the, the second order impact in a, in a world in which we are not saying it's just the two companies, it's other companies. I think there's going to be multiple benefit and we won't even understand what that second order and third order impact is unless we start seeing some of this work come alive. Thanks. There's a, there's a question here from Raghu about open source architectures. Um, and it really is a two part question. One is, do you think open source will benefit India's tech landscape? And then second, do you have thoughts on how it ought to be regulated in India? Um, I, and was that Raghu? Did you say Rahul or Raghu? Raghu? Yeah, Raghu. Raghu, Raghu um, um, I, I, I think it, you look like someone who's an expert. Uh, I'm not, but uh, I think uh, you would probably know that as a company, we do believe uh, in a lot of open source, uh, uh, in an open source framework. And, and I think you would know that 
uh, as we do contribute to a lot of uh, open source, including in 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 AI. Uh, not entirely related to it, but I think philosophically, I know where you're coming from. We do have a program called Data for Good. The idea is again, how do we use uh, non-personalized, non-identifiable data uh, in in a, in an extremely uh, uh, regimented way that can be used by other companies, including nonprofits. So we have a huge belief in it. Um, I, I don't know enough uh, to think about regulation of open source, but only to say that personally, as well as the company, we are big believers. And, and as you know, we have contributed to, uh, to that in a very meaningful way and continue to. Great. Um, here, here's a question from Vashista. And well, this is an interesting framing. Um, posits the monopoly nature of big tech in the United States and worries that India therefore runs risks to its sovereignty but also opportunities for growth because of the, the nature of big tech companies from the United States. So the question is, how does a country like India preserve and gain autonomy in a world where both its sovereignty and growth opportunities are at risk from, 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 from big, big global tech companies? I think there are so many <laughs> questions packed in there. Uh, yeah. which is, and and I, I, I can... Uh, you know, I, we can't have a conversation, but I, I get a bit of an inkling from that question that uh, you have a strong point of view. Uh, I, I unfortunately, I, uh, I unfortunately suspect I, I may not be fully aligned with that point of view. Um, I do believe there's an extraordinary competition uh, happening in tech uh, in the U.S., in India, and around the world. Uh, I, I think if you look at the uh, history of the world. Uh, of tech in the last 25 years, 15 years, 10 years, five years. Um, I, I think the learning is that um, very small companies create innovation uh, from nowhere and are able to knock out uh, the incumbents in a very short period of time. And and that 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 has continued to be the case. And um, I do believe uh, my personal view on this is that as as a company, we face intense competition, uh, and, and 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 therefore, you know, uh, I apologize for not agreeing with you uh, on the idea of competition. Um, at the same time, I think uh, I hope I have answered the second part of your question because that seems like a question that could have been the question for all of the last forty-five minutes in terms of you know what would be my point of view in terms of uh, you know a framework that. In, that that would make sense for India, right? And 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 to summarize, I do believe you know it makes sense to have new rules. Um, I do believe that uh, India has benefited from an open internet and can disproportionately benefit uh, from betting on working with countries that share its values, finding a global framework, uh, and and creating the the stage for Indian companies and 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 global companies big companies as well as small companies and startups to fundamentally unleash innovation in a way that can allow us to create new economic models of growth. And, and, and I mentioned some of them. It's, it's, it's the foundational layers on payments and financial inclusion. It's education and health, but also in a way that allows, even as we are building capacity in India, even as we are building uh, capabilities in India, it also allow us to access the global market for ideas, for talent, and allow us to, you know, really benefit from the fact that we now have massive scale in India, and that allows us to originate and grow and thrive Indian models that can become uh, uh, templates for the world, and UPI being an example of that. Ajit, we're coming up on time, but I, I do need to ask you this because we have multiple questions about hate speech in, in India. So I'm going to group these together and just leave it open-ended. There are questioners, uh, including Maya and Neha, who are asking about the, the trajectory of hate speech in India and how Facebook postures itself toward that in terms of its policies and uh, content guidelines. Uh, and there are also questions about the regulation of hate speech in India. So... Um, why don't you take that on, and then we'll and then we'll bring the session to a close. Yeah, uh, and and I think just to start off, um, 
as a company and as a platform, uh, we are uh, we have deep conviction that there is no room for hate speech of any kind. Um, and and those are articulated in what we call our community standards, uh, which articulate the kind of content uh, you know that frankly people agree to uh, adhere to when they use our platforms, the kind of uh, content uh, standards that we transparently define. And, and a lot of that is about uh, 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 speech, including hate speech that is not allowed on our platform. And, and the only thing, and, 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 and I have um, uh, said this in the last few weeks and months quite a bit, uh, and I want to kind of reiterate again that we uh, enforce those standards uh, without any bias. Uh, and, and we will continue to do that. But we are fully aligned that we have a responsibility uh, around safety and security of our platform. We have an obligation, and that includes making sure that uh, we are able to limit uh, and hopefully eliminate hate speech on our platform. And we, we, we get, you know, Maya, Neha, we continue to get better. Uh, over the last three years, what we have done as a company is invested behind our values and our articulation of our intent including in people. We have built very large teams, including in technology. We managed to get a disproportionate number of content that violates our standards, including hate speech, before they're uploaded or before they find distribution on our platform. And then we have human reviewers on top of it. So this is something that we take seriously uh, and we are very sincere about that. Great. Well, Ajit, let me ask you one last question before we bring it to a close, kind of a cosmic one. When you look at the next, let's say, one year, three year, five year periods, what are the things you're most excited about in terms of the Indian opportunity for I, I Facebook think, or for innovation more generally? Yeah, yeah. I, I think one, I, I genuinely do believe, Evan, that as much as the last five or 10 years, but five years in particular, has been so exciting on innovation and entrepreneurship in India, I believe it we have barely scratched the surface. We're only starting to recognize what it means to have 700 million people online. And I believe that's going to create an explosion of new economic models. Uh, second, I believe that many of those models are going to go global. Uh, I, I think we're going to start seeing fundamentally disruptive models emerge out of India that will uh, create models for, for, for all of the world. Uh, and that will be across sectors, right? Whether it's education, health, financial services. Um, and, and, and third, um, I'm really excited, I think, and this is some of the work that we as a company are doing about fundamentally the movement on the next platform, right? Around AR and VR. Uh, I, I think we are, we are starting to scratch the surface of it. I think India will have a big role to play. And if anything, I think the last six months, Evan, we were talking about it before we started, has just shown the power of, you know, we have seen the power of connecting people, right? I think uh, we have seen, you know, the human beings have a deep desire to connect. And, and we have seen how that evolves into new ideas, uh, 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 businesses. But I feel excited about if we can solve the, the idea of presence, right? The idea of people being connected to each other, even if they're not in the same room. Uh, I'm excited about where that could go. And, and I, I believe India will have a huge role to play there as well. That's a great place to end. And it's an incredibly exciting time, actually. And you and the company are at the heart of that. You know, this is an India-based summit, but my colleagues at Carnegie India, they call it a global technology summit because yeah, it, right. ultimately it's really about the connections between India and the, and the world. And whether it's the participants from, from Africa or from Asia or from North America, it really is about uh, what's happening in India and how that connects to what's happening globally. And there are these models that can be exported and scaled in incredibly interesting ways. So congratulations on everything Facebook's doing. You're really at the heart of that in many ways. And we appreciate you taking the time. It's been a very interesting conversation. So thanks, Ajit. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Great